Hey everybody, uh, welcome to Hot Jams parentheses TAC, uh, and uh, I'm going to talk about uh, my experience building a uh, decoupled uh, app with uh, Drupal and React, a uh, music discovery app, uh, app. So it's kind of uh, kind of goes through my experience being new to decoupled Drupal and, and also React from some perspective, and hopefully we can have uh, a good. Uh, rocking good time in this last session of the day. Uh, the bit.ly link there, bit.ly uh, slash hot hyphen jams, uh, links you over to a repository. So the code's up there, these slides, a bunch of other resources, um, previous uh, recordings of this talk, all that good stuff. Um, so, uh, I am uh, Brian Perry, I'm a lead front-end developer at Bounteous. I, uh, I, I grew up on the East Coast, uh, in Rhode Island, I used to live in Waltham, uh, so it's really great to be back in uh, in this area and back at Design for Drupal. Currently live in the Chicago suburbs, which is also great. Um, and I'm a lover of all things uh, components and component-driven, so building with components in, in Drupal, uh, design systems and tools like Pattern Lab, and then increasingly building with uh, component-based JavaScript frameworks like React. Uh, also a lover of all things Nintendo. So happy to talk to anybody about the cool things they're playing on their Switch. Uh, for me, my son and I just recently beat uh, Cuphead, which is a really awesome but incredibly difficult game. Um, so feel pretty accomplished about that. And I am uh, on the internet in a bunch of different places and would love to internet with you. Yes, you. Uh, I work, uh, as I mentioned, at a company called Bounteous. We've got a, a handful of uh, different offices, but a couple in the Chicago area. Uh, Drupal is one of a handful of things that we do, but I, I work with a great team of Drupal folks and learn uh, stuff from them on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, we are uh, currently hiring, um, so if you're looking, for, uh, looking to do some great Drupal work, get in touch. And if you're looking to have great Drupal work done, I can also get you in touch with some people. So uh, what we're going to talk about today is kind of a side project uh, that I fell into as a way to learn about decoupled Drupal and, uh, and React. And then also this is a, a, a project that I did. Uh, I initially built it at the end of 2017 and I've talked about it at, at Drupal events, but um, being given the opportunity to, to present it again here, I'm also gonna focus a little bit on what has changed since I uh, introduced myself to this stuff and since I uh, kind of built this app. And uh, spoiler alert, a whole lot of stuff has changed. <laughs> Um, so, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the, uh, kind of how the side project came to be. Uh, it just kind of, uh, presented itself. So that's, that's where we'll, we'll start. So this is, uh, a, a picture of me, uh, performing, uh, at Improv Boston, just a little bit down the street, uh, my solo musical show, Briami Sound Machine. Um, and I, I used to do, uh, comedy for a number of years around here and, um, the secret of many comedians, myself included, is that we all secretly would rather be in a band. <laughs> and uh, that was no exception uh, for me. So I was able to kind of get a little bit of that out on stage, but also music has always been something that I've been interested in. Uh, listened to, and still listen to, a podcast called Switched on Pop, which is really great. Um, and it really goes into like the modern pop music landscape and tries to break down popular songs and help you understand like why they work, why they're popular, trends in pop music, stuff like that. It's a great podcast. Um, uh, years ago at this point, one of their earlier episodes, they had a guest on uh, named uh, Rob Mitchum, who's in the, also from the Chicago area. And what they had Rob on is uh, one of the things that he does is every year he just creates a big Google spreadsheet that has all of the year-end best of music lists all aggregated in one place. So uh, listening to that, I thought that would be a really interesting data set. Uh, this is a screenshot of the 2017 spreadsheet. Uh, depending on your stance on big spreadsheets, this either may look horrifying or incredibly wonderful. Um, I'll leave that up to you. Uh, but it's definitely a really cool data set. All the albums, uh, the lists and where they fall in, there's averages on different tabs. Um, so I thought, you know, it might be fun to find some way to, to play with this. And then also around that time, I'm hearing all kinds of things in the Drupal community about uh, decoupled and decoupling and 
progressively decoupling things, fully decoupling an application. Uh, we're not saying headless anymore at this point, it's decoupled now. <laughs> um, but it was certainly uh, a hot topic uh, in the community and something that I wanted to, to learn more about and understand. And then also hearing all kinds of stuff about React. Um, and uh, things like uh, React and Redux for state management and uh, other frameworks are wonderful, uh, but was just hearing so much about React and uh, wanted to learn more. So uh, this was a nice opportunity where I kind of realized that all these things could kind of come together as a way for me to, uh, to learn some of this stuff. So we have the cool data set. Uh, I'm interested in learning more about decoupled Drupal and, and React, and so let's, uh, let's go ahead and try to build something. And then also, I uh, realized that this it seems to be the, the Jamstack concept that I've been, been hearing about at that time. So for those not familiar with uh, the concept of the Jamstack, Jam in this case stands for JavaScript, APIs, and markup. And yes, the A in Jam stands for APIs. It's kind of like Inception of some kind there. Um, but so the, the Jamstack and some of the benefits that it brings uh, potentially uh, improve performance, um, you'll, you can potentially have things that are, are rendered uh, statically. Um, it's easier to, to scale uh, things like this because it doesn't require like a typical LAMP stack. Um, it can be hosted in a variety of different places, put on a CDN. Um, potentially a better developer experience. It kind of depends on you know, what you're developing in, but you, know, you might not have to have a full scale VM. You might not have to you know, pull down a database to be able to get a local development environment up and running. Yes, you'll probably have to wait for NPM install, but... Um, and then also there's potentially some security benefits uh, in that it's just your uh, static assets that are being hosted. And in the case of Drupal, for example, um, you don't necessarily have to have your full Drupal site either up online all the time, or you know, it might be an API that your application accesses, but under pretty strict requirements. Um, and uh, you know, given our, our fun on Wednesdays, you know, there's potentially some, some benefits there for us Drupal folks. Um, and that's a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of stuff that the Jamstack potentially promises, so why not throw in free pony rides? Uh, some of it sounds uh, a little bit hard to believe <laughs> at, at points. But you know, another thing that I kind of wanted to, to learn more about. So now that I know, you know what, what I'm working with and what I'm trying to build, the first question is, what approach to decoupling, what decoupled architecture am, am I gonna go with? Um, this uh, set of lyrics from uh, Snail Mail, it's probably, it's my second favorite album of last year. Uh, it, it's great, check it out if you, if you haven't heard it. Um, but, uh, so as far as decoupled architectures, there are a few potential flavors. There's fully coupled, so it's the Drupal that you know and love, doing all of its, its Drupal things, all Drupal all the time. Progressive decoupling is a situation where uh, the initial request is handled by Drupal, um, but then uh, JavaScript uh, flavor will be strategically sprinkled in where you need it. So you know it might be a, a portion of the page or, or a block or something that, that's handled by, by React potentially. And then there's fully decoupling, and in this case, the uh, initial request is handled by your, your JavaScript application. And then it will communicate with a Drupal API to get content as it needs it. And this, this image, uh, this is from uh, one of Dries's how to decouple in insert name of year here posts. It, he tends to update them every year. Um, and th there's a lot to this, but really what this image is just trying to uh, communicate and why I included it is that the decision as far as where you want to land on that scale is not necessarily like a black and white thing. Um, you know, it kind of depends on, on your project and your needs and what you're looking to do. But the, the f closer you get to fully decoupling, the more things that you uh, might lean on in Drupal you become responsible for. So things related to security and uh, editor experience and, and things like that that you might take for granted. Uh, that Drupal provides for you, you then become responsible for. Um, so it's potentially kind of where uh, like the importance of uh, editorial needs versus developer experience or if it's somewhere in the middle as far as where you might end up on this scale. 
Uh, for me, it, it actually was a pretty easy decision. I, I wanted to build something that was fully decoupled. Uh, I did not really have any editorial needs because the data is coming from that, that big Google spreadsheet that we saw. And uh, I, I definitely wanted to force myself to uh, go all in and, and learn as much about React as I could through this project. So, uh, choosing your Drupal. This, this uh, used to be titled uh, Choosing uh, Your Decoupled Distribution, but the landscape has changed a little bit there. We'll, we'll talk about that. Um, and this, this lyric really doesn't have anything to do with this slide, but uh, I tried to pick something from you know, some of the, the top albums of the year. And uh, I was on uh, Genius looking at these lyrics, and just this section, just seeing it written out, is such wonderful nonsense <laughs> that I had to include it. Um, because, I mean, I've heard the song a number of times, but never really <laughs> listened to it. <laughs> Woo, facts. Um, so, in, uh, in 2017, as far as uh, the uh, options, there were a, a number of different decoupled distributions. There was Reservoir, which was an Acquia project, uh, Contenta, which is uh, certainly still around, and it's also possible to roll your own uh, with, with uh, traditional Drupal and not use a distribution. Uh, now, uh, the Reservoir project is uh, deprecated, um, so it's really a, a decision between Contenta, which is a very popular decoupled distribution, but now with JSON API in core, um, you know, a lot of the things that, uh, you know, it was certainly a contributed module before, but it, it's easier than ever to also just expose an API in your traditional Drupal install. But uh, looking at uh, a distribution and what that offers you, so this is a, a few screenshots from uh, Contenta in this case. Um, so the admin UI is focused around this API approach. So there's things like content models and API in the menu. And then uh, it provides automatic API documentation through uh, Redoc or what I think used to be called Swagger, but it's really nice that you see all the exposed endpoints example responses, the parameters that you can pass into it, um, all provided to you out of the box. And then any of these are also gonna give you your JSON API endpoints. Drupal has a great JSON API implementation. You get a uh, you know, nice spec that it follows, all your data in a nice JSON object, a lot of different ways you can sort and filter and uh, include relationships of data and things like that. So as far as like making the decision between a distribution or not, um, personally at the time I chose a distribution, I actually used Reservoir, which now doesn't really exist anymore. Um, but starting with a distribution for me when I was initially doing this project was really helpful because a lot of the, the stuff was uh, available out of the box. I didn't have to set it up. It was much easier for me to kind of see what the possibilities were um, using uh, Drupal to ser serve an API like this. Um, so I would say that if you're new to it, starting with something like Contenta can be really helpful. Um, but now with JSON API in core, uh, going forward for projects that, that need this sort of decoupled approach or, or an endpoint exposed like this, um, I'm more prone to just use the core JSON API and not rely on a distribution. Uh, but that's my personal take. So uh, next, migrating our data. So we have, uh, we know how we're going to approach decoupling, um, but now we gotta figure out how we're gonna get our data from uh, our spreadsheet into to Drupal. Uh, or another way to put it is let's cram numbers easily. <laughs> um, and uh, this, uh, this album is uh, Pusha T's Daytona. I don't know if anybody uh, has seen this album cover before or knows what it's a picture of, uh, but if you don't know what that is and feel like being bummed out later, Search and read up on what it is. It's a bit of a bummer. Um, but anyway, uh, so how do we get our data from our Google spreadsheet into Drupal? Um, this may not be a surprise to a lot of people in this room, but uh, the Migrate API uh, can help you, and it is uh, quite awesome in Drupal. So in this case, I created a custom Migrate module that also installs a album content type that it relies on. And it pulls data directly from that Google spreadsheet using uh, Migrate Plus JSON. And uh, it also augments the data when it pulls it in with the data from the Spotify API. So we can have some additional bells and whistles in the app. 
So one thing, uh, one little weird hack that makes this possible is in a, a Google Sheet, in your sharing or publishing options, uh, if you select to publish the entire document as a web page, you also get this weird little uh, URL, which gets you a JSON response of all of the content of your spreadsheet, um, if you know your document ID. So that's what makes it uh, possible to get the current state of the uh, spreadsheet in the migration without having to like put a copy in the repository or something like that, which is pretty wonderful. You have to kind of understand the somewhat strange structure of this response, but once you get a handle on that, you're good to go. So uh, let's look a little bit at the code for the migration, just kind of at, at a high level here. Uh, so we uh, gave the migration an ID and a label and all that stuff, and then we're using a, a custom source plugin, which we'll get to in a second. It, it mainly serves to communicate with the Spotify API in this case. And then we are fetching HTTP and parsing JSON. And then we have our URL that we saw before. And then the item selector is basically where in this response it's gonna parse the rows. In this case, it's at, at feed slash entry in that response. And then we map out all the fields that are in the, uh, the JSON response that we're parsing. Um, so, and again, there's kind of some weird structure that you get in that, that Google Feeds JSON response, but you just map all of the fields, give them a label. Is dollar a regular character or does it mean something special? It is just a regular character in this case. Nothing confusing about that at all. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for, for whatever reason, there's like dollar sign T for like a text string in the, the response, in the JSON response. But yeah, regular character. And then uh, it's going into uh, a node, so uh, entity node destination plugin and using a default value of album for the album content type. And then uh, map the fields from the spreadsheet to uh, your fields on your content type, so title, field, album, artist, etc. And the album content type that we created really maps kind of one-to-one -one to the data that's in the spreadsheet. So now the uh, album source plugin, um, and really the kind of main thing here is using a, the Spotify web API. There's a, a few different packages that allow you to communicate with the Spotify API. And then in uh, prepare row here in our uh, URL source plugin that we're extending, um, we initiate a session with the uh, Spotify web API here, provider token and all that good stuff. And then we do a search based on the album field in the spreadsheet, and that field uh, is a combination of the artist and the album title. So that's a good, unique string that I found typically gets results back from the API. And then we're just uh, setting up a few additional fields based on that Spotify response. So we're grabbing the Spotify album ID so we can link over to Spotify so people can play uh, the album and then also grabbing the uh, album art in a couple of different sizes. So just a few things, but obviously makes it a little bit more fun in the app. And then uh, returning our, our modified row here. So uh, we run the migration and we get all of uh, our album data in Drupal, just like uh, it exists in the spreadsheet, it's wonderful. And uh, you edit any one of those, you see all the, the fields you'd expect, or Spotify information, all the averages, rankings on all the different lists. Really great data set, hanging out in Drupal now. So, we, we got the spreadsheet all the way over to Drupal, we have our API exposed, we're ready to start rocking and rolling, and now it's time uh, to look at uh, building the React app itself. And uh, making sense of React and all of its component parts. Um, so obviously there's a ton that you could talk about here with React. What I'm gonna focus on is um, just kind of my experience being new to React at the time, but also um, revisiting the app for this talk. Uh, I'll also focus on some of the things that have changed in the React ecosystem uh, since I built this. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's actually uh, take a look at the app itself.
um, before we get into some code. So just so we can understand kind of in context what it does. How's everybody doing out there? We're still hanging in? Still got this? Yeah, some thumbs up. All right. Awesome. Okay. So uh, by default, we see this cover view. So we see a list of, uh, in this case, the top 50 albums ranked by uh, like a consensus score. And then if we select different items in the list, we see you know, the album cover, uh, a link to open the album in Spotify, which is pretty nice, so you can go in and listen. And then there's also all of the lists that it, it uh, was ranked on and where it was ranked in the list. And then there's this control panel on the left-hand side, um, so it just allows us to filter and adjust the data set um, in each of these visualizations, so you know, we can adjust the number of rows. Um, we can filter by like an artist. Um, I got my Jeff Rosenstock uh, shirt on right now. Um, so his album Post, and there's a few other things that have Jeff in it. Jeff Tweedy released an album last year, and <laughs> Also, when I searched for this, I found the amusing uh, album title of approximately 1,000 beers. I'll have to listen to that one. Um, but yeah, as we, uh, you know, as we uh, enter a search criteria, it uh, filters the data set and the changes uh, cascade down to the components and the, the albums in the result set. So we can also sort it based on other criteria. So we just like sort it by the artist. So it's you know, pseudo alphabetical. Um, and then we can also pick any specific list here. We can see, you know, as a Chicago guy, I can look at the Pitchfork list and see what was number one for Pitchfork. Um, and then there's also a couple of other visualizations. So there's a table view here. Uh, I just kept this in. This was actually just a, a really useful way for me to start experimenting. So I kind of started by getting basically like a spreadsheet representation of the data in React so that I can see what happens when I sort things and filter the data set and, and stuff like that. And there's also this uh, list view, which is uh, a little heat map. So we can see for, in this case, the 50 albums where they show up on all the different lists. And uh, you know we can do something like uh, we have it sorted to show Pitchfork's top 50. So we see all the top 50 for Pitchfork in order, but then we can look at cases where, you know, there's an album on Pitchfork's list that hasn't showed up anywhere else. Nina Cherry, only on the Pitchfork list, um, didn't quite crack uh, the other list this year. Um, and then in, uh, in the 2017 data, I, I, when I gave previous version of the talk, I always made fun of this, uh, the uh, Rolling Stone was the only, uh, only list that had uh, U2 at number two and it wasn't, didn't make any other list. And it turns out recently that news broke that uh, the guy who owns Rolling Stone like basically dictated that they put them on the list because he's friends with Bono. <laughs> so all kinds of secrets in this data. But that's the, uh, the basics of what, what the app does. So now let's get back and uh, take a look at how it is built. So, uh, how, do, how does one create a React app? Uh, you can use the Create React App package to do that. Um, so you can install it uh, globally. I believe you can also use uh, NPX now if, if you have an up-to-date version of, uh, of Node and that prevents you from having to have to uh, install it globally. But either way, uh, when you run that, you'll, um, if you run uh, Create React App, my app or the name of your project, you'll get a big NPM install output. And then if you change into the project directory you created, you can run NPM start, and that's gonna spin up a, a little development web server with a hot module replacement, so when you make changes in code, you'll see the changes reflected immediately in the browser. It's a nice experience. You can run NPM run build, which is going to build a production-ready asset of your application that you can then host somewhere. And then uh, there will be dragons ahead. Uh, but there's also the concept of ejecting Create React App. So by default, Create React App keeps a lot of the configuration behind the scenes, uh, which is nice if you're new, new to this. Um, but if you want to change certain aspects of configuration, you would have to eject. Um, and that just exposes like the Webpack config and things like that. So to that, I would say like if you uh, are using the default configuration and it works for you, that's fine. Don't sweat it. Uh, it's also not the end of the world if you have to eject. You can 
uh, change as little or as much as, as you see fit, but have to kind of understand Webpack to do that. Okay, so uh, now let's, let's get this data into our React app. There's a handful of ways that you could do that. Um, you could use a library like Axios, which is kind of like uh, the jQuery Ajax method, if you're familiar with that, but I wanted to use the, uh, the fetch uh, JavaScript API. So this is a little function that, that handles uh, grabbing the data. So, oops, here we go. Uh, so this function get album data, it, it takes in an endpoint and finds an array of uh, album data. And then the fetch API uh, returns a promise. So we're kind of chaining together some promises here to act on the data that we get back. So the first thing is we uh, take the response and resolve the JSON data from it. And then we go through that JSON data and we, we take it, take the albums and add it to our array. And then if there's another page of results, we call this get album data function again recursively to get the next set of results. The, uh, the JSON API module, there is no way to just get all of the data, you know, unless you have a small data set. It is paged, um, which is probably a good thing. It wasn't necessarily what I expected uh, initially, but um, you, know, you probably don't want to get thousands and thousands of, of rows in a single response. So uh, this will just give us our, our albums. You know, when there's no more results, we just return the albums, and then they are now available to the app. Okay, so we got our data. Let's actually start uh, putting stuff on the screen. Um, so this is an example of, the, uh, of an album component. So it's one of those rows in the, the cover view visualization that we saw. Um, so this is uh, Kendrick Lamar's album. It was the clearly, uh, by far, the, the top album of, of 2017 by, by critical ranking. Um, but on the right here, we have a render method. Um, so we have our, our album component, and then there's uh, what are called props that get passed into that. Um, and so that's coming from outside, being passed into the, the component, and you know, depending on what gets passed in there, as the props change, the uh, component will re-render itself. So if I take, uh, this is my fun example I've always done with this. So if I uh, change it to uh, Kenny Loggins, you know, we see that it updates in the component and uh, Kenny Loggins' popular uh, album, Darn. A -R Darn by Kenny Loggins. Um, so again, as those props uh, uh, update, the component re-renders. You see that in this little example real time here. So we've got uh, the, the props coming in. That's what the, uh, the render method in this case looks like. But let's actually see how uh, the component itself is defined. Um, so uh, there's a handful of different ways that you can uh, define a component in React. Um, the one that I used initially building this app was uh, the class-based approach here. So uh, we're extending the react.component class. And then there is a, a render method where it returns the JSX uh, markup that we saw here. So there's a little bit of logic here. So if um, there is a cover image, it's going to render one version of the component. If there's not a cover image, it renders a different version. Um, and then we've got things like this album row. You can think of that as just another uh, custom React component. Um, there's a little additional wrinkle to that that we'll get to uh, eventually. But then a bunch of props that are passed into it, including things like functions to handle events, um, you know, clicking on uh, a row, for example. But there's also uh, things that look a little bit more like traditional markup, like uh, image and you know, an image source and alt and stuff like that. And then we can also access all of the props. So we can say this dot props dot cover image and title and everything to render that stuff in this component. And then also uh, this component uses uh, prop types. So that's just a way to kind of validate the things that get passed into the component. So for example, we're saying that um, the title is a string and it's required. Uh, so it'll throw an error if you don't get a title. And then we're exporting the uh, album component so we can import it elsewhere. So, uh, you know, I mentioned the concept of using a class to define the uh, component. Um, since building this, I would say, from what I've seen in the React world, uh, it's definitely shifted over to 
a functional approach to defining components and people are navigating away from using classes for a variety of reasons. Um, but in getting prepped for this talk, I did some work kind of refactoring things to use this more functional approach and migrate away from classes. So, you know, it might look something like this. So you don't have your class that you extend, but uh, this is a pretty simple example here, but we're just exporting, uh, doing the default export for this uh, visualization component, and we're just returning our JSX. There might be a little bit of, of logic or, or state defined there, but uh, I found in working with this that this functional approach helps kind of separate uh, some of the logic from the components and makes them a little bit more presentational, uh, which I like. But this is definitely, from what I've seen, kind of the direction that, that the React community seems to be going in. All right, so we talked about uh, props, which is kind of uh, external information or external data being passed into your component and influencing it. There's also a concept of state in React, and that's more like what the component knows to be true about itself. It's you know variables and data that are stored inside of that component. So there's a quick example here. This is also the, um, the kind of class-based approach. Um, but in your constructor, you can define state. So we have a selected sort and selected list here. And then we're setting the state variable to include that. And then there's also a couple of functions here so that when the, there's an event where the, the dropdown list changes, it's going to go update and reset the state. So if I you know, handle sort change or handle list, it updates the selected sort or selected list. All that to get us to the point where if I ch take this dropdown and select average, it updates the state. So now that the internal state of this component is field average rather than consensus score. So that's all local to this component. And then, uh, so talking about um, the functional approach that we saw versus like the class-based approach. Um, with a functional approach to components, you don't have the ability to have a constructor and set some of that state in the same way. So a, a new feature of React uh, that lets you uh, handle and manage state in a functional component is called hooks. Um, definitely don't really have the time to go that deep into it. Also, pretty new to it, and don't know that I do an exceptional job of explaining it, but uh, really it's just a set of uh, kind of special uh, functions that let you do things like manage state in a functional component. Um, you can also, uh, there's a use effect hook that lets you, when uh, state changes, handle like what, what they call side effects. Like, so if you need to uh, change some other component or something like that, or pull in new data. Um, Use reducer is just a, another kind of a redux-like method to handling and managing your state. And there's also uh, use context, which will, uh, another hook that we'll, we'll get to in, in a second. Um, but this is a pretty simple example. So uh, you're defining a, a pair here. Uh, count is the state variable. And set count is just a function that lets you update it. Um, and you're saying use state and setting the default value to zero. And then here, just in this button, when you click on it, it just runs set count and sets the count to, you know, plus one. So pretty simple. Obviously, there's more complex uh, approaches to that. Um, but it's really just a different way to set uh, your state. Um, and I, I do find, it took me a while to kind of get my head around it, but I do find it uh, a little bit cleaner than the class-based approach. There's potentially a little bit less boilerplate, uh, some of the logic can be a little bit more uh, isolated. Okay, so we have our, we talked about props and state and all that good stuff. Um, so in building this app, uh, a question that I asked myself was, you know, where, what components should have state? Where should the state of this application live? And I, uh, I started assuming that the components would have their own state and, you know, each the, the album would have its own state, and the album detail on the right-hand side would also have its own state. Um, this is a pretty common pattern, but uh, saw that the, uh, uh, both of those components have a lot of overlap. They have a lot of the same state, and then also some of it is literally the same. Like, we need to know what album is active, and there's a lot of duplication there. Um, so 
I took the, took the state and kind of lifted it up a level higher. So maybe if we have it in the visualization on the right hand side and the control panel has its own state, maybe that makes sense. Um, but still found that there were things that needed to influence both or, or that each component needed to be able to set certain pieces of the application state, like the number of rows that are being displayed or the filtered data set, things like that. So kind of eventually got to a point where really most of the state of this application is stored kind of at the top level of, of the app. And then that uh, put me in a situation where because these components need to be aware of that application state, uh, we have to pass those props down through a bunch of different components, what people sometimes refer to as prop drilling, which sounds pretty rad. Um, but here, just looking at the visualization component, we've got our, our albums. And we pass that into the visualization, but the visualization has those three tabs up at the top. Um, so for example, when we're rendering the cover view, we also need to pass the albums into that. So one, one level down the chain. And then in the, uh, the uh, album list here, it's actually taking that album data and iterating through it to render out each of the album rows and so on and so forth. And you might find yourself in a situation where you have a bunch of nested components, you gotta pass that data through and through and through, and it, it ends up being a little hard to manage and feeling a little bit ridiculous. So that's a situation where uh, you might wanna use some sort of solution for state management like Redux. Um, that's been a popular solution. Uh, but also in the what has changed in React since I initially built this app, there's also a, a feature called Context uh, which is an, another option for that. And context really at a high level just lets you uh, set uh, like application state somewhere and at a component down in the chain, just go and grab it. Um, obviously oversimplifying things, but here's just a little simple code example here. So this is just a, kind of a little boilerplate code where we actually uh, set our context. So we're using that create, uh, React create contacts there. And then we create a, a provider and a consumer. And uh, we'll see how that's actually used here. So in the kind of top level app, we wrap the, uh, the child components in a provider. So it's that provider that we set. And then we pass some data into it. In this case, it's an object that has a lot of the application state. Um, and then when you uh, do that, when you have that provider, any component inside of it has access to that context. So in this cover view component, which is a few layers down, um, if we import the app context uh, component that we looked at before, we can create uh, this data object that uses the context hook, use context, and it just gets back um, that app state that we passed into it. So it just gets all of the, the um, state for the app, and then we can grab the things from it that we need and have it available to that component. And we don't have to pass that stuff down and down and down and down. So a bit of a different approach, um, but it, it's definitely a lot cleaner um, and can kind of simplify things and prevent you from having to do that prop drilling. Um, talking to like uh, coworkers and things like that, I don't know if, well, I'll, I'll say it this way, that uh, the people that I work with don't necessarily see it as a, at a point where it could completely replace uh, something like Redux to manage state. Um, but for an app like this, that you know, is just my fun little side project, it, it definitely does the trick really nicely. Okay, so uh, a few other uh, details uh, in this project. So, uh, Got to go into some fun CSS and JS controversy here. Um, so uh, I definitely wanted to understand uh, the different ways that you can style uh, an app like this. So um, you certainly can just import a CSS file, just a regular CSS file. Um, so import control panel.css. It's going to make those styles available. And then you can use the class name prop to um, you know, add a class. So not class, but the class name prop. Um, but you can add your classes and style things basically how you used to. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. But 
uh, all, all the cool kids are writing their CSS and JS, so I wanted to, to learn more about it. Um, and that's my, my poor son, for some reason, having a, a really frustrating bowl of Cocoa Pebbles. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so the, the library that I, I used uh, to experiment with this is uh, Styled Components. There's a handful of, of different options. Um, but I actually like Styled Components quite a bit. So uh, it allows you to essentially create like a uh, component or a wrapping component that has your styles. So we're creating this album row, and that was actually that custom component that we saw before. And it's a, a style div. And then within backticks, you can just include the uh, CSS, the styles that you would typically write, all in that JavaScript file. And then perhaps more interestingly, uh, you can also respond to the props that get passed into the component. So this is a, a really simple example, but if the uh, active album prop is set, then we change the style. We give it a, a blue border around it. Um, and that's pretty cool in that like, to do something like that, you would have to maybe like juggle classes. Um, and for this component, like it, it knows about itself. It has its, you know, either its state or the props that are getting passed into it. So why doesn't it just adjust how it displays based on that information? And yeah, as mentioned before, so any of these styled components you can use as regular custom components, and that's the album row that we saw before. So uh, this certainly isn't an image that, that I created. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if others have seen this before, but um, many of us have probably been uh, you know, taught a particular separation of concerns. JavaScript, CSS, and HTML are separate things. Um, so uh, the initial reaction to this might be one of mild terror, seeing everything all in one, one file, uh, completely reasonable. But uh, for uh, like a component-based approach like this, it, it it really just is separation concerns from a different perspective. So for each of these components, we have all of the stuff in one place that we need to render this component predictably, including our CSS. Um, so, you know, I certainly get both perspectives, but uh, the more that I, uh, you know, use this approach building out this app, um, having all that bundled together does make sense in a way. And then as far as, uh, uh, I don't know if this is necessarily uh, new, um, but it wasn't what I used when I initially built it. But since uh, initially building this project with styled components, I've used in other React projects uh, CSS modules as an alternative. And that's a little bit more, uh, probably going to be more in line with what you're used to with writing CSS or, or SAS. You can actually just write it in a CSS or SAS partial and then import it where you need it. Um, but it does scope the styles locally by default. And I actually didn't talk about that with styled components. Both CSS modules and styled components, when it uh, adds the class name for that style that you define, it also adds like a unique identifier so that, and that prevents the styles from leaking out. They, they won't be applied to anything else because with that weird unique class name, it's only gonna be applied to that component. So they get scoped locally. Um, which, again, depending on what you want, may or may not be a good thing. Um, but yeah, I like CSS modules quite a bit, and uh, it also ships with Gatsby out of the box. So if you use Gatsby, which I know has been gaining in uh, popularity in the Drupal community, um, it's also there ready for you to play with. So now, uh, onto building and deploying. Go on, girl, and use that sauce, <laughs> is the lyric here. Uh, so. Um, revisiting our, uh, our Jamstack here in this application. Um, we've got uh, JavaScript, which is React on the client side, and our APIs are provided by Drupal and can be hosted anywhere that you can Drupal. And then our markup is a, a production bundle that, that we export, and I'm hosting it on GitHub Pages, um, but you could host it pretty much anywhere. In this case, it's a little less uh, static and more in the realm of a single page application where when the app loads, it has to go talk to Drupal, we get that spinner. Um, but uh, the static markup here, or, or also uh, Chris Coyer, uh, CSS Tricks recently wrote a, a post, I think, uh, with the title of like Sham Stack that makes the pitch that uh, the, the static hosting is kind of the secret sauce of the Jamstack, but it's all kind of in the same neighborhood. Um, 
having this stuff statically pre-rendered really opens up some, some interesting possibilities. Um, and again, kind of goes back to Gatsby, which uh, I, I know is pretty popular in, in the, the Drupal world. Um, but working within uh, this stack, uh, something that I, I ask myself frequently is, could more of this app be static? So we see our little loading spinner. Um, the, the data for this, right, uh, the end of the year list only comes once a year. So for most of the year, this data isn't changing at all. There's really not much of a reason that we need to go get it from Drupal dynamically. So uh, the answer to that is definitely yes, more of this app could be static. Um, when I first built this out, I was kind of, I struggled to figure out how I could make it more static though. Um, since then, I've played with uh, Gatsby a lot on some other, other projects and uh, my personal sites in, in Gatsby and I like Gatsby quite a bit. Um, so uh, Gatsby can generate static content. You can use it as like a static site generator, but they also kind of pitch themselves as a, uh, you know, a, a project that can help you create, uh, easily create React apps that are very fast and performant. Um, so when I was first doing this, this sort of app didn't really seem like a good fit for Gatsby. Uh, but uh, in getting ready for this talk, I took the time to port it over to Gatsby and uh, found it to be pretty great. Uh, so we can take a look at that here. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, this is the local version of the, the Gatsby version. So we reload this guy. You know, we're not getting the spinner. Um, in this case, when it does its build, it talks to Drupal and gets all of the data that it needs, and it's just available in this static bundle, which is what we would end up, you know, publishing on GitHub Pages. Um, so, porting this over to Gatsby, there actually wasn't all that much work um, because I'm really just taking these components from the app and just using them in Gatsby. Um, the harder work was using things like hooks and context that I talked about before. Um, but also, it lets you do cool things like I created uh, a couple of different pages for each year of this data set. So I can just jump right to 2017, and it, because the data is just there, it's already been built out, we don't have to talk to Drupal, we just see all of the 2017 data, and we can go explore that. Um, so it's actually pretty nice. Uh, I haven't gotten a chance to deploy this yet. I ho hope to do it soon. Um, but I think this is definitely what I'm gonna do going forward. It'll allow me to like maintain past years. There's no reason for me to have Drupal up and running. Um, I'll just use it when year end of list time comes around and build my 2019 data. Um, and let's just take a quick look at like a Gatsby page component here. Um, so, you know, I mentioned that there, there really wasn't a ton of work in, in porting this. So, um, this is a, the 2018 uh, page component here. So I import, you know, just React and uh, GraphQL from Gatsby. And then I have just the app component that renders the whole app, basically. And there's this uh, GraphQL query, which if you haven't used uh, Gatsby, you might not be familiar with, but um, using the Drupal source plugin, it basically crawls the JSON API, gets all of the data for this app, and then we can write this query to make that data available to this component. So really, the only thing that's kind of unique about this is just I pass in a filter for 2018 on this page. And on the 2017 page, I pass in a filter for 2017. And then that data object is just available to this, this page, and I just pass it right into my app component. And then everything else just functions like the other app. So, it's pretty cool. It uh, has uh, performance advantages, um, but it's also really great that the, there's really no reason for the, the Drupal site to need to be up and running um, aside from the times when this data set is changing. And also, I expect that there'll probably come a point where if I want to do uh, visualizations that are over multiple years of data, maybe we'll get to the point where it's just too much stuff to store statically and maybe it doesn't scale and we might have to go back to the app. Right now, it meets need, so it's pretty cool. And then uh, wrapping up here, just about up on time. Um, so we'll end with uh, me being a potential uh, buzzkill. But another question that I was asking myself in building this app 
was, did I need Drupal for this project? And uh, the honest answer is, is no there. So uh, if you have a way that you can provide a, an API and provide this data to a React application, you don't necessarily need Drupal. Uh, whatever is, is comfortable for you can definitely do the trick. If you're uh, like a Node developer and can spin up something using Express to do this, that's fine. Um, and I'll definitely get the job done. But for me, uh, it was a great help because I'm familiar with Drupal, I'm comfortable spinning up a Drupal site using the, the, like the contented distribution or even just JSON API, it's really easy for me to uh, get this data loaded into Drupal and provide an API that I can then build something against. So if you're familiar with Drupal, uh, it's a really great option. And, and even if you uh, aren't, but really don't have a go-to way to be able to spin up an API like this, Drupal's a, a really solid option. So kind of depends, as, as the answer almost always is. So that's the, uh, the, the lightning tour there. Hopefully it was uh, interesting. The repository is up. Uh, a lot of stuff for you to play around with. I'm gonna try it hopefully uh, soon to deploy the Gatsby version. Um, and uh, come check it out to see what was uh, popular in 2019 at the end of the year. Cool, uh, I have a few, a little time for questions probably if anybody has questions. Um, yes. Um. Sort of a basic question. Um, the whole endpoint, like you know, in the React app, like that's like the main guts of you know how the data is stored. Do you have any views of you know uh, we're actually where I work, we're in the process of migrating from seven to eight. Mm -hmm. We have some new sort of web apps that we're trying to move from React and together. Uh, but I'm wondering, is there a way to like anything special you have to do to sort of generate or output that like content type you have that you create the album? into this nice format of JSON sort of uh... Yeah, the question was if there's anything special that you need to do to get your data in, in that format. Um, I, I wanna say no, right? There, there are probably limits to that. Um, you know, uh, if you have like complicated entity references or kind of unusually structured data, um, it might take some extra effort to be able to get at what you need, but JSON API, the JSON API module does a really great job at just exposing all of your data uh, in that response and you can do what you want with it. Um, and you mentioned like Drupal 7 and Drupal 8. Uh, in that case, I, I don't think there is a, like a JSON API alternative for Drupal 7, so you'd have to use something like uh, web services module or REST or something. Um, so, uh, if you're familiar with that, that might be okay. Uh, certainly, I found it more pleasant to work with JSON API, personally, but... Yeah, I think, yeah, we're definitely trying to leverage that. Um, yeah. So this is a good example. Uh, just gotta get in there and dig in. So As is always the case, yeah. Cool. Yes. So on your final question, do you need Drupal for this? Um, the Google Sheets is producing a JSON feed. Um, yep. Couldn't the React app go directly to that and not have anything in the middle except for the Spotify? Yeah, so uh, yeah, I also did think about that. So yeah, you could uh, go directly to the Google Sheet. If you're using Gatsby, I think there are plugins that would let you do that. Uh, there's a couple reasons why I still think it's useful to have it in Drupal. Um, one is uh, it was easy for me to, to talk to the Spotify API and get that additional data in there. But also, it's really just a way for me to save this stuff. Uh, so, you know, if you're talking directly to the API, it's got to talk to it all the time, but I, I can save this database and bring it up later. Uh, but not necessarily strictly necessary, no. Cool, all the way in the top. I'll try to project. Um, you're doing a great job. Great. Uh, you mentioned uh, towards the middle about how the React community has moved away from using classes uh, and towards a functional approach and that there was a bunch of reasons why. Um, just wondering if you had some insight into some of those other reasons. Yeah, uh, I, I probably can't give you, so the question was uh, why the React community moved away from classes uh, to a more functional approach. I, I probably can't give you a great answer in that I'm, I'm still a little bit of an outsider, uh, but my understanding is that there's a few reasons. One, there is the perception that classes are hard to understand. I don't agree with that necessarily, but that is a perception in the community that I've seen. Um, 
And I also think there's a, a potential performance benefit that having that highly functional approach uh, can provide and ways that it can be a little bit more easily isolated and testable. Um, I think some of that, the performance angle of that is not yet fully realized by React, but something that they think they could leverage if everybody's on board with this approach and hooks long term, there can be some big benefit for. And then I think part of it is also just uh, everybody in React wants to change things all the time. <laughs> cool. All right. Excellent. Well, thank you guys. This was fun, and we made it.